Hi everyone, welcome to this uh, video. In this video, what I thought I'd show you is uh, I'll start off with a few simple examples uh, that you uh, are able to study to some degree analytically, uh, you know, just with pen and paper or blackboard and chalk or whatever you prefer. Uh, but I will also show you how much richer the the physics can be or the the visualizations that uh, arise from just knowing a little bit about computations and, and Python programming. And uh, from there I, I think I'll show you some some more hardcore uh, physical sim simulations. Um, but yeah, so let's let's just crack on, shall we? So here I have a couple of strip scripts. First, I have a simple uh, pendulum, and uh, I won't go. I, I won't outline the scripts thoroughly. I'll simply link them uh, down uh, in the description box below, so you could check them out if you like. They're pretty easy to understand. I'm using a system called VPython to simulate uh, to, to visualize them. And um, here, this one is a, a simple uh, pendulum, as you probably can probably tell from the name. And uh, the idea in these kinematic uh, uh, simulations is, uh, is uh, they're, they're quite simple. Uh, first, you uh, compute the force on your uh, objects, as one always does in, in physics. And then from that, you can apply Newton's second law here uh, and compute the acceleration. And then you integrate once to get the velocities. And then you can integrate again to get the, um, the position and you update the position and then you increment your time and then you continue doing this until you are uh, until you're done so here i have set some fixed time limit limit at which the simulation will stop so let's just try to uh, to run this and see what happens so here you go this uh, appears to be the most boring video game in the world but it is as you can see a simulation of a simple pendulum which swings back and forth and uh, this, um, this system, this library vPython, allows me to visualize it in the browser. In a pendulum system like this, what you're able to do analytically is uh, you can find the speeds at the lowest point by using some energy conservation law, or you might be able to compute the, the period of the pendulum and so on. But um, not much more than that. But uh, if you have a computer program, you can um, do a bunch of stuff. So I've, I've written this pendulum as uh, if the, um, the string or the rod that it hangs from is actually a spring. So let's see what happens if we uh, try to uh, reduce the spring constant. It will probably be a bit more exciting, I hope. So there we go. We see that the, uh, it stretches and bounces around. I think I'm able to zoom here. Yeah, there you go. Uh, just to see a little bit better what's going on, I'll uh, add a trace to the uh, the ball, or the yeah, so we can see the path that it takes. There you go. And this is uh, you're not able to compute this path, which is very or somewhat complicated analytically. So we can we can just play around with the physics of, uh, of such a, a system if uh, if we implement it on a on a computer, which is quite cool. Uh, so let's go back to a, a stiff rod, increase the spring constant, and uh, and one thing you cannot do on paper is to actually have air drag, right? So we can introduce that quite easily. Uh, we'll run it. And you will see that uh, it slows down quite slowly. So this is an example of a non-conservative force or a non-linear force, which is a very difficult to deal with analytically. But here it's it's quite easy. You see, it behaves exactly as we as we suspected. What happens if we have negative air drag? So now we would uh, expect it to move a little bit faster each time. And there you go. And then we we'll go faster and faster and faster until my computer breaks. Probably. Yeah. Let's stop it there. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, it's it's quite fun. Or what if we didn't have any any gravity? What would happen? You're right, nothing. There is no gravity. But what what if we started it off with some initial um, initial initial velocity, right? So initial velocity is in the y direction to minus ten times that, minus twenty, and then we'll also make this spring more springy. Look at that! It's quite, quite fun. So this is uh, some object anchored to a firm fixed point in space or whatever, and you know it follows this 
seem somewhat systematic. But I think you get my point that you can, this is one of the benefits of using computations um, that you can, uh, it's also fun to visualize, right? And I, I want to stress that point that there's a difference between a simulation and a visualization. So this is a visualization that we see on the, on the screen. Um, and, but that's just, you know, taken from the actual simulation, right? So a simulation would also be to, to simply um, print out the, uh, the position of the ball at every step or, or something like that. Like this, which is arguably a bit boring to look at, but it's still, you know, a, a simulation. Or we could, you know, uh, make a graph of the kinetic energy of the ball. It should appear somewhere here. Yeah, there you go. And now it bounces about and you can see the kinetic energy. We also have some drag now, so it stops after a while. It's a bit weird to have air resistance in space, but yeah, those are the things you could do, you know. Uh, so let's remove the drag and we do, we'll do something silly. Say the uh, uh, the the springiness or the spring constant of the force would depend uh, on time by some sinusoidal function, and uh, we'll see what happens. So yeah, look at that. This is probably the negative one, and then does all sorts of things. <laughs> oh wow! Look at that. Hello, where did you go? So let's move on to my second example, which is the classical n-body problem. And this is a gravitation uh, problem. So here I have included um, two bodies in space, a large body, which is supposed to, um, to model the, the sun. And I also have a small body, or, which is supposed to be uh, the earth. And I'm, we are going to include Jupiter afterwards but uh, let us first start with um, with this one here the idea is the same that we compute the uh, the forces all the objects will interact gravitationally with all the other objects so we have to iterate over them and then we um, compute the interaction with all the other ones and then we use the uh, Newtonian gravitation law there and we compute the forces and then we perform an uh, integration first we compute the acceleration and then the um, velocity and then the position of, of each, um, each object. Let's try this. And there you go. This is uh, only supposed to be a simple um, circular orbit and something like this I think um, you'd be able to do uh, analytically. It's not too difficult. Uh, but what if we had a third object and we have a much more chaotic system with some emergent properties and it would be very diff difficult to solve the system. Uh, one option is to just say that okay the um, the mass of the Sun is about a million times that of the Earth and about a few hundred thousand times that of Jupiter which we're going to add now so we could simply just say that yeah the only interacting force uh, would be that with the Sun which is a justifiable simplification I, I, I think but uh, still let's let's add Jupiter and see what happens. And we also need to add it to our uh, list of, um, of heavenly bodies. All right, so now we are ready. Here we go. Um, yeah, and the first thing that I want you all to notice is that the orbit of the Earth is still uh, pretty circular. and um, But the, the orbit of Jupiter would be more uh, elliptic. And I think one Jupiter year, the time it takes for Jupiter to orbit the Sun is about 12 times that of the Earth. So qualitatively this is correct, I, um, I think. Good. Be because the Sun is so massive, it, um, it is very dominant in the system. And one very interesting thing to do here is to just, what if we increase the mass of Jupiter by a thousand? because that is enough to, to make the mass of Jupiter very similar to Earth, Earth or closer to it. Uh, so it will actually pull on all the objects in the solar system. So let us start. Look at this now. And you see the, uh, the sun is moving. The um, Earth is still sort of being dominated by the, uh, the gravitational field of the, uh, the sun. There you go. Hey, where are you going, guys? <laughs> it's quite kind of quite inter interesting. And you see that the the uh, the paths that these uh, these guys make now they are completely 
you know, chaotic. It, how would you be able to study a problem like this if, uh, if you try to do it uh, uh, with pen and paper? Or you could just, you know, uh, the algorithm that um, is used to integrate the problem is, was made of probably 200 years ago, so and then people uh, actually did it. Let me provide you with an example. Yeah, so here is uh, an article from the Norwegian Science, uh, oh, sorry, the New Norwegian Science uh, Museum, and uh, this uh, professor at the um, the Institute for Theoretical Astrophysics here at the University of Oslo. He had three grad students painstakingly compute uh, the paths of charged particles in uh, the atmosphere, and uh, had them laid out. So these. Um, these rods here, these metal rods that the model stands on, they're actually uh, spines from an umbrella. And uh, so they, they did the same thing that my, my computer does here. Actually, okay, what is the force on the particles uh, at a certain time, time step? What would be the acceleration from that force? Then the velocity and then you compute the, um, the new position. And then increase to the next time step and continue like this until you yeah, got this uh, this cool figure. <laughs> so it's interesting that they actually did it before actually doing it on a computer. It sounds absolutely horrible. And now you might be thinking that well, these these examples that I show they're they're a bit simple, right? But uh, real researchers hired at you know world-renowned universities use the same techniques uh, in uh, a field of physics called molecular dynamics. Uh, which is used to model fractures in in rocks and and these kinds of phenomena and or how or how friction works and I actually have a very cool uh, uh, visualizing tool, which is the same tool that uh, these kinds of uh, scientists use. So you you start at the same assumptions as you would in my simple um, my my simple scripts that I just uh, showed you with a potential between the uh, atoms. Let me let me just show you here. So here you go. Here is a visualization of uh, some gases or something mixing. Uh, this is a visualization tool called um, Atomify. The concept is exactly the same as uh, as I've been showing you in the, the two scripts I wrote. Uh, you have some define some potential between the the particles, and uh, that potential will uh, provide you with a force. And, uh, uh, through which the particles uh, interact and then you can um, compute their acceleration, velocities and new position for each uh, time step. Isn't this cool? And this is based on a, on a system called uh, LAMPS uh, which is a scripting language of sorts. So here is the, um, the script. So it's, it's quite short as you can see. Um, and this Atomify system comes with uh, a bunch of examples. Here we can, I uh, really like uh, this one, for instance, which is, uh, this is supposed to be a model of, uh, of friction. You see they're moving towards each other, each other. so you can see, consider these, um, these uh, slabs to be um, some uneven surface and you see how they, the um, imperfections in the, in the surface hit each other and then you have friction. I think you can uh, oh, increase the velocity or just the speed. There you go. And there you see that the the particles sort of cling to each other. You have some van der Waals force or whatever. It's it's really cool, I think. So here is a shearing example where we have two kind of slabs that one is going in that direction and the other one in the other direction and uh, it's in 3D yeah. and you see kind of what happens to all the, all the bits and pieces of the formation. And the last thing I want to show you is that um, some students here at the university where I am working they, they do this so I, I actually have a master thesis of a good friend of mine so here you sort of see the um, the type of stuff he did. So he had uneven surfaces, and these are just part of those uh, surfaces. The um, these um, wow, spherical-like structures, and he applied the force on the top and the bottom, and kind of crushed them together. And those were the kind of simulations that he uh, that he ran. 
And so here is a, a better figure of how that will work. So you had some uh, different kinds of rock or two uh, pieces of rock or whatever. This is very applicable in, uh, in geology and you would, uh, these would um, have some pressure pushing them towards each other and then they would uh, crack up and all sorts of uh, things. So we can look at, um, and here is the displacement that he, he showed fitted to a, a nice uh, function. And as you would probably assume, because you have, you're, you're modeling each individual part of um, the pieces that you push together, right? So you will have these, this little, this kind of chaotic behavior, but you, indeed you have some, some train trends throughout the simulation. And he also added um, added water, and these these are silica systems, so they would be soluble in uh, in water. And he actually found that uh, when you added uh, water, you have um, a different displacement. So this is uh, very interesting because you cannot really probe the insides of rock in this manner. So this um, is a very novel uh, finding. Uh, I guess that's it. I, I hope that uh, I gave you some insights into the kind of freedom that computations uh, give you. And I, and I also hope that you saw that some uh, phenomena and some systems, they are simply impossible to study without a computer in physics. These molecular simulations, they're very uh, nice to work with because you can visualize them. And if you don't believe that this is, you know, proper research, the guy that who wrote the master's thesis I showed you, he actually, he ended up at uh, Harvard, is there now, continuing this kind of work. So it is absolutely top level uh, research. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you in the next one.